Hey dear, welcome back to the world of cross-dressing stories. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. Now, let's dive into the story. My name is Chris, and I suppose you could say I've always been on the quieter side. High school can be a battleground of sorts, a place where voices like mine tend to get drowned out by the louder, more boisterous ones. My parents, caught up in the whirlwind of their jobs, often leave before I wake and come home long after the sun has set. This leaves me with a lot of time to myself, especially in the afternoons when the house feels particularly empty and quiet. Our neighborhood is a tightly packed collection of townhouses, walls thin enough that sometimes on a silent evening, you can hear the muffled lives of those living next to you. Despite the physical closeness, there's an unspoken rule of privacy, or maybe it's indifference. People come and go, but their eyes rarely linger long enough to read the loneliness on a young boy's face. Yet, I've always felt the weight of a few gazes, curious or perhaps concerned, through their curtains. These afternoons are the hardest. I walk home from the bus stop, my backpack slung over one shoulder, feeling the eyes of a few neighborhood watchers tracking my solitary march. Once inside, the house greets me with silence, save for the ticking of the living room clock and the occasional sigh from the aging floorboards under my feet. I make my way to the kitchen, fix myself a sandwich, peanut butter usually, because it's simple and filling and then retreat to my room where the rest of the afternoon stretches out like a vast, empty canvas. Homework is a distraction, at least for a while, but even that can't fully fill the void. It's during these quiet hours in the solitude of my room that I've come to know myself, but it's also when I feel the most invisible, a ghost in my own life, drifting through without leaving a mark. Sometimes I wonder if anyone would notice if one day I just disappeared. Would the quiet observer from across the street wonder where the shy boy with the sad eyes had gone? In these moments, surrounded by the four familiar walls of my bedroom, I often turn to the window, looking out at the rows of identical houses. There's a comfort in knowing I'm not alone in my loneliness, that behind those other windows, there might be others just like me, waiting for something, anything to happen. That particular afternoon began like any other, with the same monotonous rhythm that had come to define my days. The air was slightly crisp, the first whispers of spring just beginning to unfurl. I walked home, my mind partly on the algebra test I'd have the next day, partly lost in the music that trickled from my earphones, a small escape from the reality of my isolation. As I approached my house, the sense of unease that occasionally washed over me began to creep in, making the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, I attributed it to the usual anxiety that often accompanied my solitary afternoons, pushing the feeling aside as I fumbled with my keys at the front door. The house welcomed me with its customary silence, but as I stepped inside, a deep, unfamiliar voice shattered the quiet. Hello, Chris, it rumbled, causing me to freeze in place. My heart pounded in my chest as I slowly turned to face the source. Standing between me and the safety of my living room was a large, burly man, his frame filled the doorway, his presence dark and imposing. His eyes, a sharp contrast to his rough exterior, scrutinized me with an unsettling intensity. You're just as pretty as they come, he muttered almost to himself, a twisted smile playing on his lips. Fear gripped me, rooting me to the spot. Who are you? I managed to choke out, my voice trembling. They call me Mr. Black, he said, stepping closer, his large hands reaching out towards me, before I could react, his grip was firm around my arm, pulling me towards him. I usually watch the girls, you know, but you, you'll do just fine. The realization that I was in grave danger began to dawn on me, a cold, sinking feeling that turned my stomach. Mr. Black's intentions were clear, his interest in young girls a chilling hint at the darkness of his desires. Yet, in his twisted perception, my appearance had made me a target, a substitute for his usual victims. I struggled my feeble attempts to free myself proving useless against his strength. Let me go, I cried, panic-stricken and breathless, my voice echoing weakly against the walls of my once safe home. But Mr. Black was unyielding, his hold tightening as he dragged me through the house with a terrifying determination. No one's going to hear you, he whispered harshly, his breath hot against my ear. You're all alone, aren't you, Chris? Just how I like it. As we passed the living room mirror, a glimpse of my reflection. 
pale, frightened, so starkly young, flashed before me. In that moment, the surreal nature of my predicament hit me fully. This was not a bad dream. It was a nightmare unfolding in broad daylight within the supposed sanctuary of my home. Mr. Black's plan unfolded with a sinister precision. He had watched, waited, and chosen his moment when I was most vulnerable, alone and unprotected. The isolation I had so often felt now played against me, a cruel irony that left me exposed to the whims of a man whose intentions were as dark as the deepest shadows of night. With each step deeper into the house, away from the front door and any chance of escape, the reality of my situation sank in. I was at the mercy of Mr. Black, caught in a terrifying web from which escape seemed impossible. The fear was paralyzing, a heavy weight that threatened to cry spirit as I was pulled, pulled relentlessly towards an unknown fate. Mr. Black's grip was unrelenting as he maneuvered me upstairs to my mother's bedroom, a place that once felt like a sanctuary of warmth and maternal love. Now, it became the stage for a chilling transformation. He flung open the closet doors, revealing rows of my mother's clothes, her dresses, blouses, and skirts, a colorful array that contrasted starkly with the darkness of his intentions. Perfect, he muttered, his eyes gleaming with a disturbing satisfaction as he rummaged through the garments. He pulled out a soft, floral dress, holding it up to me. This will do nicely, he said, his voice a low growl of anticipation. My heart sank as the fabric brushed against my skin, the innocent patterns mocking my dire situation. With a forceful push, he directed me toward the dressing table, cluttered with an assortment of my mother's makeup. Sit, he commanded, and I obeyed, my body trembling. The reflection that greeted me in the mirror was a pale shadow of myself, eyes wide with fear, my usual resolve crumbling under the weight of my predicament. Mr. Black began his work, his large, matte, rough hands surprisingly deft as they applied foundation, blush, and eyeliner, transforming me step by step. Each brush stroke felt like an erasure of my identity, painting over the person I thought I knew. The soft bristles against my skin, the subtle scent of the makeup, it all felt surreal, a bizarre contradiction to the fear pulsating through my veins. As he worked, I caught sight of my changing reflection. With each application, the boy I was seemed to fade, replaced by someone new, someone unrecognizable. The dress draped over my shoulders, the makeup subtly enhancing features that no longer felt like they belonged to me. It was disorienting, seeing myself morph into this alternate persona under his controlling hand. Deep inside, a strange turmoil began to stir. The clothes, the makeup, they weren't just tools of my humiliation. They were objects that sparked an unexpected curiosity. Despite the fear, there was a part of me that couldn't help but be intrigued by the image in the mirror. The softness of the dress, the way the makeup altered my expression, it was as if I was exploring a part of me that had lain dormant, hidden beneath layers of imposed masculinity. This internal conflict only added to my confusion and fear. Here I was, being forced into a role I never asked for, by a man whose intentions were undoubtedly sinister, yet part of me was fascinated by the transformation. It felt like a betrayal of my own sense of self-preservation, a curious pull towards something I should have unequivocally despised. As Mr. Black finished his work, he stood back, a cruel smile curling his lips as he admired his handiwork. There, he said, a mocking tone in his voice. Isn't that better? Now you're almost as pretty as the girls I watch. His words were meant to degrade, to remind me of my helplessness, but they also echoed the strange, conflicting feelings swirling within me. Trapped in this twisted scenario, I felt caught between my desire to escape and the unsettling allure of this new persona. It was a battle within myself, fighting against the fear and the inexplicable draw towards the very thing that symbolized my captivity. As I sat there, dressed in my mother's clothes, made up to fit a stranger's fantasy, the lines of my identity blurred, leaving me lost in a sea of conflict and fear. The air grew heavier with each passing minute, as Mr. Black's demeanor shifted from perverse satisfaction to something darker, more menacing. He paced the room, occasionally glancing at me with a look that sent chills down my spine. I sat frozen on the chair, the floral dress clinging to me, a cruel reminder of my vulnerable state. His next movements were deliberate, filled with a chilling intent that made my heart race with dread. Let's see how far we can go, shall we? He murmured, 
his voice a terrifying whisper as he approached me with a length of rope in his hands. The sight of it ignited a primal fear within me. My stomach churned, and I felt bile rise in my throat. Desperation clawed at my mind, a frantic search for a way out. But there was none. I was trapped, both physically and in the terrifying reality that had ensnared me. Suddenly, the mundane sounds of the neighborhood, the distant barking of a dog, the hum of a lawnmower were shattered by the rapid, urgent knocking at the front door. Mr. Black froze, his eyes narrowing in suspicion. The knocking grew louder, more insistent, a lifeline thrown in the deep, dark waters of my despair. Police, open the door, a firm voice commanded from outside. Relief washed over me, a wave so powerful it nearly knocked the breath from my lungs. Mr. Black cursed under his breath, casting a menacing glance in my direction. Not a word, he hissed, pointing a threatening finger at me. The terror of his warning was palpable, but so was the hope that blossomed with the presence of the police. He hesitated, a moment of indecision that cost him dearly. Within seconds, the front door was forced open, and the house was flooded with the sounds of authoritative voices and heavy footsteps. Mr. Black made a move as if to escape or possibly confront the officers, but it was too late. The room was quickly surrounded, the police officers' stern faces a sight that brought tears of relief to my eyes. Police, don't move, they shouted, their guns trained on Mr. Black. He raised his hand slowly, the realization of his capture dawning on him as he was swiftly handcuffed. One of the officers, a kind-looking woman with sharp eyes, approached me. Are you okay? She asked gently, her voice a soothing balm to the chaos that had unfolded. I nodded, unable to form words, my emotions a tangled mess of relief, fear, and a lingering confusion. She draped a blanket over my shoulders and guided me away from the chair, away from the nightmare that had almost claimed me. As I was led out of the room, I glanced back to see Mr. Black being escorted out by the police, his head bowed in defeat. The sight of him, powerless and controlled, was a stark contrast to the fear he had instilled in me. The house, once a symbol of my solitude, now buzzed with police officers documenting the scene, preserving the house of horrors for evidence. Outside, the fresh air felt like a new beginning, the sunlight piercing through the dark cloud that had hovered over me. The nightmare was over, and though I knew the road to recovery would be long and fraught with challenges, the overwhelming feeling at that moment was gratitude. Gratitude for the observant neighbor, for the timely arrival of the police, and for the chance to reclaim my life from the shadows that had come so close to engulfing it completely. In the days and weeks that followed my rescue, the world seemed to carry on as if nothing had happened. People went about their daily lives, oblivious to the turmoil that churned inside me. The echoes of my ordeal lingered, haunting the quiet moments of my days and the restless stretches of my nights. I was safe, yet I didn't feel it, not completely. Every shadow hinted at danger, every unexpected sound a potential threat. My parents, shocked by the events and burdened by guilt over their frequent absences, became overprotective. Their concern was a balm, yet it also served as a constant reminder of what had occurred. In the safety of my home, surrounded by familiar walls and the faces of my family, I grappled with the complex emotions that Mr. Black's forced transformation of me had stirred up. The clothes, the makeup, they hadn't just been tools of my captivity, they had awakened a curiosity about my identity, a part of me that I hadn't known existed. Was I drawn to these expressions of femininity, or were they merely imprinted on me by trauma? These questions spun in my mind, clouded by the memories of fear and helplessness. Recognizing the depth of my struggle, my parents arranged for me to see a therapist. Dr. Ellis was a gentle, insightful woman who created a space where I could unravel the knotted feelings inside me. During our sessions, I spoke of the incident, of the fear, the helplessness, and the confusing array of emotions tied to my enforced cross-dressing. She listened, her nods and thoughtful silences a comforting rhythm amid the chaos of my thoughts. It's okay to explore these feelings, Dr. Ellis encouraged one afternoon, her voice soft yet firm. What happened to you was terrifying, and it's natural to be conflicted about the aspects of your identity that were manipulated. Let's explore these together, at a pace that feels right for you. Her words were a permission I hadn't realized I needed. 
In the weeks that followed, we delved deeper into discussions about gender and identity. We explored the concept of gender fluidity, the societal constructs that dictate how we express ourselves, and the freedom that comes with self-acceptance. These sessions became my refuge, a place where I could question, cry, and begin to understand myself without judgment. As I navigated this complex journey, I found unexpected allies. A support group for teens dealing with similar issues of gender identity became a weekly fixture in my life. There I met others like me, those questioning, those certain, and those in between. Their stories and struggles echoed my own, providing both solace and a mirror in which I could see my evolving self more clearly. This community taught me that identity isn't always clear cut. It can be fluid, a spectrum where one can find a place without needing to conform to fixed labels. My own experiences with cross-dressing, once a source of confusion and distress, began to take on a new meaning. It wasn't about the clothes or the makeup. It was about the freedom to express all facets of my being, to embrace a wholeness that included both the masculinity and the femininity within me. As my understanding deepened, so did my healing. The trauma of the abduction, while never completely gone, began to lose its sharp edges, smoothed over time by therapy, support, and the powerful tool of self-expression. In embracing the complexity of my identity, I found not just acceptance, but a profound sense of peace. I was more than a victim. I was a survivor, a multifaceted human being capable of resilience and growth. This journey was not just about recovering from a dark chapter in my life. It was about discovering the narrative of who I was and who I could be, free from the shadows of fear and doubt. As the seasons changed and the leaves began to turn, marking the passage of another year, I found myself stepping more confidently into the person I was becoming. The support group for teens, a haven where discussions flowed as freely as the coffee, became a cornerstone of my week. Here, I wasn't just Chris, the kid who had survived an abduction. I was Chris, a friend, a confidant, and increasingly, a voice for others grappling with their own identity crises. Inspired by the strength and resilience I saw around me, and fueled by my own experiences, I decided to extend my hand further. I began volunteering at a local center that provided support for victims of abduction and abuse. Each person I met, each story I heard, echoed parts of my own fears and hopes. Sharing my story I found not only helped others feel less alone, but also cemented my own healing. It was a mutual exchange of strength, a shared journey of recovery and empowerment. The true test of my growth, however, came with the approaching school event, a winter gala themed around the idea of renaissance, symbolizing rebirth and new beginnings. It was an apt theme, not just for the school, but for me personally. The decision of what to wear, once a source of anxiety, now felt like an opportunity to express the myriad parts of my identity. With the support of my friends from the group and the understanding of my family, who had come to embrace my journey with open hearts, I chose an outfit that defied traditional norms. It was a tasteful blend of masculine and feminine elements, a tailored blazer with floral accents, a soft, flowing scarf, and a pair of sleek, fitted trousers. The makeup was minimal, just enough to highlight my features, reflecting the balance I had come to find within myself. The night of the gala, as I stepped into the school auditorium, transformed with decorations of rebirth and renewal, a wave of nervous excitement washed over me. My heart raced, not with fear, but with anticipation. As I mingled with classmates and teachers, the warmth in their compliments and the acceptance in their smiles told me all I needed to know. I was seen, not just as I appeared, but as I truly was. The evening unfolded with laughter, dancing, and a sense of community that I had once thought was beyond my reach. Standing there among friends and family, I felt a profound sense of peace. The struggle to understand myself, to accept the complexity of my identity, had brought me to this moment, a moment of renaissance, of rebirth, into a life where I was free to be authentically me. As the music swelled and the floor filled with dancing couples, I took a moment to look around. The faces, joyous, vibrant, alive, reflected back the journey of growth and acceptance we were all on. In that beautifully decorated hall, I realized that life, much like the evening's theme, was about continual rebirth and finding light after darkness. The gala ended on a high note, with promises of future gatherings and heartfelt goodbyes. 
Walking home under the starlit sky, my family beside me, I knew that while the road ahead might still hold challenges, I was equipped to meet them with a full heart. For in embracing my identity, I had found more than just peace. I had found a way to turn my past into a beacon of hope for others, lighting the way forward with every step I took. In the aftermath of my ordeal and the transformative experiences that followed, I often found myself reflecting on the profound lessons woven into the fabric of my journey. Each step, each challenge, and each victory painted a vivid portrait of the themes and twists that had become central to my story. My life, once defined by routines and expectations, was irrevocably changed by the events that unfolded with Mr. Black. The forced cross-dressing, initially a tool of humiliation and control, inadvertently opened a door to a part of myself that I might have never explored. This aspect of my story underscores the fluidity of identity, highlighting how it can be shaped and reshaped by our experiences, both traumatic and enlightening. As I ventured into therapy and embraced the support group's community, I discovered the layers of my own identity, each one complex and rich with potential. This journey of self-discovery was not just about accepting the facets of my identity influenced by trauma, but also about celebrating the entire mosaic of who I am. Trauma, while often destructive, can also serve as a catalyst for deep self-exploration. For me, the terror and helplessness I felt under Mr. Black's control stripped me down to my most vulnerable self, revealing strengths and fears I was previously unaware of. It forced me to confront aspects of my identity that I had suppressed or ignored, pushing me to explore the realms of gender and self-expression that I might have otherwise left unexamined. This exploration was painful, yet ultimately empowering, allowing me to emerge not as a victim, but as someone with a deeper understanding and appreciation of my own complexity. The dynamic of power and control played a pivotal role in my narrative. Mr. Black's initial control over me was absolute, defining the darkest moments of my captivity. Yet as the story progressed, the locus of control shifted dramatically. The act of reclaiming control over my life and identity was gradual and fraught with challenges, but it was also a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. By the end of my journey, the power I held was not just about autonomy, but about the ability to shape my own destiny and redefine the terms of my existence. Perhaps one of the most transformative aspects of my recovery was the role of community and support. The isolation I felt was profound, but it was through the connections I forged in the aftermath, whether in therapy sessions, support groups, or among friends and family, that I found the strength to heal and grow. These relationships not only provided a safe space to unravel my fears and hopes, but also mirrored the multifaceted nature of my own identity. They taught me that healing is not just a personal journey, but a communal process, where shared stories and experiences weave a tapestry of support and understanding. As I stood at the school event, surrounded by faces that reflected both newfound understanding and acceptance, I realized that my story was not just mine, but part of a larger narrative shared by many. Each of us, in our way, grapples with the themes of identity, trauma, power, and community. And in sharing my story, I hope to offer not just insight into these complex themes, but also hope to those who might find themselves on a similar path, searching for the light amid the shadows.